My friends, Low Sunday is the traditional epithet for the second Sunday of Easter, which is today. It is called low simply because generally church attendance is in sharp contrast to last week <laughs> with a church filled to the brim on Easter. How humorous. But over time, we Episcopalians have come to grips with effective contemporary marketing of our churches. Low Sunday just doesn't do quite do the job here if we want the church to grow and people to keep coming back. Low doesn't sound very positive. Low actually sounds like a letdown. It's anticlimactic. So now we have Thomas Sunday, the newer preferred name for this Sunday because the gospel lesson for all three years of our lectionary cycle is about Thomas, St. Thomas the Apostle, that famous inquisitive disciple who demands signs to prove that Jesus is actually risen. Over the course of Christian history, St. Thomas the Apostle has been called the doubter because of his recalcitrance in assenting to the good news that Christ is risen shared by the other disciples and holy women on their accounts. He demands the sensational, he demands the visual, the physical, the empirical. But you know, the church can be demanding uh, on its saints sometimes, but perhaps today we need to give Thomas a break. After all, he was a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus. And by calling Thomas a doubter, it seems that we have already passed judgment on him and cast the first stone. According to tradition and legend, after Christ's resurrection, Thomas goes as far as India to preach the gospel. He dies when a peacock hunter misses his aim. Now, that is a euphemism for his martyrdom because the peacock is a sign for a martyr. So, which probably just means that we don't have the details of his martyrdom, but he became a martyr. The Martoma Church in South India stems from the apostolic tradition of St. Thomas. And nowadays, they are part of the Anglican Communion, which means they are in communion with the Episcopal Church. Now, some of you may also know that uh, I'm a member of the uh, Society of Ordained Scientists due to my training in microbiology before my ordained ministry. And in recent years, I have become interested in the emerging field of data science, and I've been taking classes for that. Data science is a rendezvous point of statistical analysis, computer science, and domain knowledge in various disciplines. Modern data science provides us with a previously untapped capability of resourcing and untapping massive and ever-growing amounts of information to predict outcomes and help guide decisions in a variety of domains, including the church. However, one potential pitfall is for the user of these analytics to confuse correlation with causality. I mean, with the advances in machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence, we can find connections between just about any sets of data. But none of those connections directly tells us what caused these connections, what caused these correlations and interactions in the first place. For example, data science has been applied to policing. Predictive policing, or PRET-POL, is a data science algorithm designed to predict when and where crime is most likely going to occur, synthesizing records and patterns continuously. The idea is that police resources can then be more efficiently and adequately deployed. However, Race and class-based profiling can easily be encoded in such systems, further reinforcing existing prejudices. Here we have a situation in which 
race and crime are correlated erroneously based on these flawed algorithms. But of course, by common sense, we even know that one's skin color does not cause one to become a criminal. So for the technical know-how to be effective and constructive, it must be evaluated based on common sense, ethics, and justice. So now back to our gospel. I think in the case of St. Thomas, Christians have also confused correlation with causality and pronounced the cause of his seeming shortcoming too soon. We have a scenario in which some people have seen the risen Lord and they believed in the resurrection. Thomas requests more physical evidence to be sure. For one thing, yeah, people have seen that. And from other oral accounts gathered, the author of this gospel, the evangelist of St. John's gospel, has learned sometimes that the demand for evidence is often tied to lack of faith, as we can see in various parables. He then applies this model of, okay, he's asking for evidence. It means doubt. It means lack of faith. But in fact, when we look back at the whole career and commitment of St. Thomas, Lack of faith is not consistent with all that he has done. In fact, at one point, he has suggested that he and the other disciples should die together with Jesus in his suffering, talking about commitment. So while it may be true for some people that the lack of faith prompts them to demand evidence, that really doesn't to apply to Thomas here. Rather, for St. Thomas, seeing is believing. In other words, that's how his theology or belief system is structured. It's very tactile, very empirical, very evidence-based. To fully understand and appreciate Thomas Sunday, we need to focus on the implications of his actions here. We live in a world that demands proof for just about anything. So in Thomas's inquisitiveness, we can actually see a reflection of the modern spirit of asking the right question. Asking the right question has become so important, not only in our life of faith, but also in many other parts of our living, because we often encounter situations in which there's simply no clear and complete answer at hand. So how we frame a question can lead us down different paths, not all of which will lead us to the answer we want or need, but through trial and error in our quest, in our asking, we can get closer and closer to a true revelation collectively over time. I have heard the wise also say that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Thomas may have his doubts, but fear certainly does not describe him based on what we know about him. The doubt expressed by Thomas actually leads him further into a fuller experience of faith. And part of that journey is about standing firm and not be bothered and swayed by his critics. One can just imagine that his refusal to believe without seeing Christ himself is probably not very well received by those around him. But he has to stick to the course, and based on how the story was recorded and handed down to us, we can see that his doubt was not seen as a welcome quest for faith, but rather a demerit counted against him. His tale is presented to us as a teachable moment on what not to do in our relationship with Jesus. But Thomas's wish eventually comes true. He gets to meet the risen Lord face to face. He gets to inspect the scars from his wounds caused by the crucifixion. Jesus then says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We need to be careful in, in interpreting the words of Christ here. Jesus is not encouraging a blind adherence to him but rather, Jesus' words elevate us to a different reality, a divine reality in which we can begin to see with the eyes of our faith as if we were seeing with the naked eye. Seeing with the eyes of faith means 
praying, meditating on the Holy Word of God and receive the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Seeing with the eyes of faith means opening our souls to the graces effected by the sacraments of the church, by our common fellowship and collective worship together. Seeing with the eyes of faith for Christians also means not confusing correlation with causality when we look at the world in which we live in. In spiritual terms, that means not rushing to judgments about others. One of the pitfalls in Christianity over time is this uh, erroneous correlation of the Jewish people being Christ killers. On that day, the crowd was Jewish, mostly Jewish. The person being condemned was also Jewish. And yet when the story handed down to us, it was um, somehow, it was genetic that the same crowd, they caused the death of Christ because of the ethnicity, which isn't true. Uh, that it's a wrong correlation. Somehow it got into a part of the history of the church, unfortunately. So part of uh, being able to see with the eyes of faith is to not rush to judgment and sense the different layers of the complex situations in which we find ourselves. So my friends, with that in mind and with the encouragement of Thomas's doubt, which turns into more faith, let us bask in the certainty of God's love and let God unravel our intricate paths to salvation in tranquility. I'd like to conclude uh, with a prayer from the Easter Vigil. I know uh, not many of us uh, were able to come to that, but it's a very timely prayer for our reflection on this Sunday. So let us pray. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.